but Jesus named him Peter. He was a simple fisherman off the west coast of the Sea of Galilee in northern Israel. He was strong, independent, and had a direct, impetuous way about himself. He was married and lived a fairly normal life until Jesus said, follow me. Peter would become one of the 12 disciples. He was among Jesus' closest friends and boldly proclaimed his lordship. He was also first to cut and run and was first to deny Christ when he was crucified. He was the first that Christ appeared to after he had risen from the dead and Peter would be the first to raise his voice and preach on the day of Pentecost. He wrote his first letter to the churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia around AD 63. His letter is intended for Christians who journey through this world as aliens and strangers to find their hope in Christ alone. All of these are found in 1st Peter. Let's pray together. Father, as we come and we seek you in your word, Lord, we pray that your voice would be heard, that we would hear what you have for each one of us today that we'd be transformed by your word. That we would love you more. That we would love others more. That you would teach us what you would have us do in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are in our second week of doing our church-wide study on 1 Peter. Hopefully some of you have been able to join some groups, some, um, some of our life groups. If you haven't, you can still join. I'm sure they'd be happy to have you. We have some groups on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. And uh, if not, you can do your own personal uh, life group at home with your family if you want to use Right Now Media. Um, that's free to you. The study guides are there. They're free. We have some out in the lobby, and we also have some in, in our office for you leaders. So uh, hopefully you're joining that and you're able to engage with us as we walk through the book of First Peter. So like I had mentioned yesterday, I gave you a little bit of background on 1 Peter. Uh, the people that he is writing to, if you remember, a lot of them are, have been exiled. Um, as Christians become, are, are persecuted, uh, just shortly, like 20, 25, 30 years after Christ, the, the number of Christians have grown so great um, in those times that when persecution happens or when Rome uh, actually burns, it's blamed on the Christians by Emperor Nero. And so um, as Peter... Uh, is writing, he's writing to these people who are persecuted, who are, who are being told to leave Rome. Uh, some of them end up in uh, Ephesus, some of them end up um, going in the other direction, and, and you know, as, as it scatters, the good news for the church is the church actually begins to grow because they proclaim the gospel of Christ. So God uses those um, movements of Christians in, at that time to grow his church. So as we've uh, been looking at this, one of the things that Peter calls uh, the, the people he's talking to are strangers in this world. You're strangers in this world. And it's quite an interesting identity. But what I want to talk to us today, as we spoke about last time, is I'm going to talk a little bit more about who you are, your identity, who you are in Christ. Because who you are determines what you end up doing and how you live your life and what you stand for. Right? Your identity has so much to, to kind of draw all of those things out. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Because what's so important about the message that you get today is it will tell you exactly who you are in God's eyes. If you are a Christian. Also, if you are not a Christian, then where are you? Where do you stand in God's eyes? And why that is important is because he is your creator. He is the one who created you, and he created you for a purpose. Today's message should transform your life. If I was going to say that there is a passage in Scripture that has transformed the way that I think, even as you know, my worldview of who the world is, but also who I am as an individual, it's this. It's 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you never hear me preach another sermon, listen to this one. 
If you're half asleep, I'm going to say this. you got to wake up because it is transformative what you are about to hear. And that's not because I'm saying it, but it's because it's coming from the Word of God, and it's specifically for us as Christians, right? So that's what I want us to hear that today. So we're going to talk, first of all, a little bit about the work that God is doing in your life, the construction that is going on. As Christians, we use this term called sanctification, right? If you are declared not guilty of your sin because of the work that Christ has done on the cross, you, by grace, have been saved through faith, right? Not by your works, but the works of Christ. If that has occurred in your life and you are declared not guilty, you are justified, God now begins a work in you. And it's a lifelong work because guess what? You're pretty messed up. You might not know that, but you are. Uh, And so God begins to work in your life. He sanctifies you. He's making you more and more, sanctification is being made more and more like Christ, right? Being more more and more like Jesus every day. And so this is the work he began in you, and he will bring it to fruition. It will, he will finally do that. So he's, we're talking about construction. God is building something, not only in you, but also the person beside you, right? You can do that. Remind them. Give them one of those. Yeah, there you go. He's doing it in you, but he's also doing it in the person beside you, right? And they need to stay awake and pay attention to what he's actually doing, right? Does anyone like construction around here? (laughs) Some people like construction. I heard heard this joke once that the reason why, if you're ever downtown and they're building those skyscrapers, the reason why they cut the holes in the wall is so that you can stick your head in and see what's going on in there, right? Because some people really like construction, but... God likes construction as well. He likes working in your life. He likes doing things and making you more and more like Christ. So, how does he do that? Well, he builds for himself a temple, a house, a house where he can be worshipped. When we talk about this, the first time you begin to kind of hear about this is found in Psalm 118, which is what Adam read to us earlier on. In Psalm 118, you get this picture about what is known as the cornerstone. If you know anything about construction, when they lay a foundation, right, they lay what is known as the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is the thing that identifies where the foundation is laid. So at our church, we have a cornerstone. Now, this one that I'm showing you is only for show, right? But it it was an example of if we had actually a stone foundation, There is the first stone. It is the stone that is in the corner that determines the direction of the other walls, and it is known as the stone which all other things are built upon, right? That is the cornerstone. I brought a picture of the foundation of this church. Some people, you know, when we talk about construction or constructing God's church, we think about a building, but it's not, right? It's the people. And the cornerstone with which the the church is built upon is actually who? It's Christ, right? He is where the foundation is laid. So even though this church first set its foundation in in 1985, the foundation is not really the building, but it's the people, right? Like the, the foundation that gets built upon the cornerstone are the people, and then we are now building on top of the foundation of those people who started the church in 1985 here. That goes back 2,000 years, all the way back to even Peter, you know, who was part of the first early church and the foundation of the Christian church. But there's a story that goes along with Psalm 118. During the time of the building of Solomon's temple, you see, God um, had established for himself a place to go with his people. So if you remember when the people are coming, or the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, He lives in the, I mean, his presence is shown by the tabernacle. Do you remember the spirit of the Lord comes upon the tabernacle? And the the place where he stays is a tent, right? It's really a tent. It has no firm walls. So once David becomes king, he lives in Jerusalem, and he has a a palace built of cedars, and he says, look, I want to build a temple for the Lord, not this tent. He's like, why should I live in this walled place where God has to, uh, has to live in this tent. And so he's like, I want to build God a temple. And God's like, I never asked for a temple, never required 
to have a place of a temple to live, but because it's your desire, it is good, he says, he says to King David, but you have too much blood on your hands. So we're going to let your son, right, someone from your line who is going to build the temple f- for you. And so David gets everything ready. Solomon builds the temple. But God alludes to the fact that this is actually not his house. He goes, there is going to be one from your line, right, from the line of David, who will build me a house that will stand forever, right? He kind of alludes to this idea that there's going to be this other house that's built by someone in the line of David. Well, guess who's the one who comes in the line of David, right? If you know anything about Christmas, the one who comes, who's prophesied, Christ comes, Jesus comes from the line of David, and he comes to build a house for God. He comes to build a house. That's what he does. But it's not a house like you think four walls and a roof, is it? What kind of house is he talking about? And so this is what Peter is bringing us to us when we read this passage. So I'm going to start by sharing with you a little bit about this idea of Christ being the cornerstone. So if you're going to read with me, I'm going to ask if you would um, join. We're going to start at verse 6. For in the scripture it says, and this is Peter quoting from Psalm 118, see, I lay a stone in Zion, Zion being the mountain where Jerusalem is on, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone that all other things will be built on. And the stone causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. And so he begins to share with you this message about this cornerstone who was to come. When they were building the temple, there was this story that went along with it. It's not scripture, but it's this kind of idea that um, when they were first building the temple, they would cut the rocks in other areas and then send them to the temple site to the temple mount where they would be laid. So the workers are working along and they get, they get a few stones that they look at and they're like, you know what, this isn't going to work for the foundation and they would roll it down the valley into the Kidron Valley. Well, after they get partway through, they realize that they don't have the cornerstone yet. So they go back to the workers and they're like, where's the, where's the cornerstone? They're like, we sent that first day. They're like, oh, we rejected a bunch of stuff that you guys sent early on because they would look at it and if it didn't seem like it was going to fit, they would reject it. They're like, this isn't being cut properly or it's not exactly working, so they would just roll it down the hill. And as the story goes, they go back down into the Kidron Valley, they find the stone, they're like, oh, this is actually the one that is supposed to be the cornerstone. And so Peter is somewhat alluding to this idea that there is one who is rejected, who God has set up, And so Jesus himself even talks about this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the three Gospels. He talks about how, he says, there is one who is the the cornerstone who will be rejected, right? Who is the chief cornerstone. And why would he be rejected? Well, because he is the one who God has chosen, who is the choice stone for building his house. But mankind, humankind, rejected him. And so Jesus is alluding to the fact that he is the Messiah comes, but all of mankind says, you're not good enough. You don't meet our expectations. You're not the kind of king that we were looking for, right? Because how could a king die on a cross? And so men or humans might reject him, but in reality, he is the one that God sees as precious. Right? It says, he is precious. He is important for building God's home. And then he explains to us why, right, as the chief cornerstone, Jesus is the foundation. In Acts 4.12, it says, there is no other name under heaven which is given men by which we must be saved. And then in Acts 4.10-12, it says, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. This is, this is the sermon that Peter ends up speaking that by the name of Jesus 
Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven which has been given to men by which they may be saved. We rejected him, right? We crucified him. We said he wasn't good enough, but in God's sight, he is precious, and he is the one who is going to build. And then so he talks about this. Non-believers, he is a stumbling stone to them, right? Because we don't like to think that the way that we're saved is by the work of someone else, right? It is by God's work, right, that Christ is crucified, that he dies for the sins of humankind, It is by the work of God that you are saved, not by your own works. If I was going to say there is the number one way that people stumble in this world over the good news of salvation, it is the fact that you can't work out your own salvation. Right? In the sense like you're not the one who does the work that saves you. You work out your salvation by faith in Christ, but you don't actually do the work of salvation. The work of salvation was the wrath of God was upon you, and it is only by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross that appeases God's wrath. It is only that way that you are saved, right? And so the righteousness, the right relationship that you have with God is only because of what Christ did, because there was no way that you could pay for your salvation. That is a stumbling stone for the world because people are like, well, maybe if I'm just a good enough person, God will let me into heaven, right? That's the way people think. It's like if, if I do more good things than bad things, then God has to let me in. It doesn't work that way, right? All have sinned. All fall short of the glory. Everyone is a sinner. No one deserves to go to heaven. No one deserves eternal life. The only way you get in is through the work of Christ and by putting your faith on what he did on that cross for you. That is a stumbling stone message to this world. To those of you who believe that, The cornerstone, Christ, becomes precious to you because you know that it is only through him. There is no other name under heaven by which you are saved. He becomes precious to you. Why? Why do you love him? Why do you love his holiness? Because he is the one who saved you, right? He becomes precious to you because there is no other way that you're ever going to be saved. There is no eternal life for you except through him. So obviously he becomes precious, and this was always God's plan right? Because when this happens, when Christ dies on the cross, when it's Christ's work that saves you, who gets the glory? God does. If you could work out your own salvation in the sense like it's by your good works that you were saved, who gets the glory? You do, right? But the whole point is to the glory of God alone, faith alone, right? Or sorry, by grace alone, through faith alone, Christ alone, by the glory of God alone, told to us in Scripture alone, right? Do you see this? This is the story. This is, this is a stumbling block to the world. People do not hear this. They have trouble with it. And so here is the good news for you and I. I'm going to backtrack a little. Second Peter verse 4, as you come to him, right? Who is this stone that was rejected? As you come to him, verse 4, The living stone, who is Jesus, who is rejected by man but chosen by God and is precious to him, right? So he was rejected by man, chosen by God, precious to him. You also, listen to this, you also, like living stones, are being built up or being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. How? Through Jesus Christ. So here's the image that you get. You are all, you are not the cornerstone, but the one who is building the house, who is Christ, has now made you a living stone. And you are all being put together, right? God is building for himself a house, so Some of you are gray Lego, and some of you are red Lego, and some of you are pink Lego, and some of you are yellow Lego, but he is putting us all together, 
and making for himself what kind of house? Did you read it? A spiritual house. It doesn't have walls or a roof. But this is why it says in Scripture, your body is a temple. Why? Because how are we a spiritual house? What do we receive when we become Christians? The Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit is in me. The Holy Spirit's in you. And then God is building for, him a ha- building for himself a house that is not on this earth. It's not a temple on the Jerusalem Mount. This is why Jesus says it doesn't, like, there's going to be a day where it doesn't matter where you worship, right? You can worship because we're all being built. But when we come together, when we all live, live the life for Christ, we are being built into a spiritual house. And this is who you are. You are part of the house of God. So have you ever thought of yourself as a stone? As a living stone? No, you don't. Often we don't think of ourselves. We don't identify as that. But there is a purpose. There is a reason for that. And he goes on and he tells us what that is. Why? So that you might be a holy priesthood. And what are you supposed to do? You are supposed to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. And then I'm going to jump down here because this is how he defines you in verse 9. If you have a Bible, mark it. Live by it. Remember it. Say it to yourself every day because this is who you are in Christ. You are, right? So the other ones have rejected him, but you who have come to him, you are a chosen people. Say it. Chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to to God, right? For what purpose? That he declares his praises to him who called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isn't that awesome? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. It, amen? Like, like that's, that's who you are. Once you were a sinner, once you were separated from God, once you were cut off, but now you are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You are chosen by God, right? You are a people of God. That is, that's amazing for us, right? If we are, if we are the people of God, the one who has done that for us is Christ, Christ brought us, and now God is building up this holy temple for himself, or this holy building, and you're part of that. Why? So that he might receive praises, right? So that he might receive worship through Christ, because we worship Christ for what he's done, and God is glorified by that. So, if you are part of the royal priesthood, guess what? It's, it's not only your pastor who stands here who people say, oh, well, he's the priest. No, 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 no. You are priests as well. Have you ever thought of yourself like that? As Baptists, one of the things that we promote is this priesthood of all believers. You are all priests. You all have an office that you must fulfill. In the Old Testament, the priests offered the sacrifices, right? The sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin, right? People would bring their lamb or their goat or whatever, and, and you would confess your sins by placing your hand upon the animal's head, and then they would slit the animal's throat so that the blood spilt out, and you were once again reminded of how grievous your sin is, right? That's, that was the idea. It foreshadowed a time when the one perfect sacrifice would come, because animal sacrifice could not pay for your sin, but the one human sacrifice that was perfect, God in the flesh, died for you, Right? Christ on the cross, and so now because we belong to him, we are in him, you as a royal priesthood, your office is to offer spiritual sacrifices, living as a living sacrifice. So your life is sacrificed for doing the work of Christ, and how you live out your office, how you be a priest, he says, he describes to us in the next few verses, right? How you do this is by bringing a sacrifice of a contrite heart. 
right? That is where you bring your sacrifice. Those who have sought God for forgiveness, those who have come and confessed their sins, those who recognize that it is only by Christ alone that you are saved and the forgiveness of your sin is only offered through him, that is where God requires of you. He requires what? Mercy, right? As your sacrifice. He requires this, what? A contrite heart. God does not despise. That is what is required of him. And as part of the priesthood, he goes on and describes, because we are a chosen people, what are we supposed to do? Because we belong to God. Why? That we might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then he says this in verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you, again, this language, aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from what? Sinful desires, right? If you're going to be part of the holy people of God, you can't claim, you cannot claim to have the Holy Spirit living in you and continue to live a sinful life and enjoy that sinful life. I'm not going to say that you never sin, because you will, you'll sin again, but do you enjoy it? Do you revel in it? Do you actually want to do it? Or is it distasteful for you, and when you sin, do you seek God for forgiveness again? Do you once again have the contrite heart, right? So you abstain from sinful desires, which war against your soul. The battle continues, right? Every day, you get up and you kill the sin that's in your life, and you fight for that again, right? It wages. There's this, soul, there's this war that wages inside your soul. Live such godly lives among the pagans, among those who don't believe, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds, right? And glorify God on the day that he visits us. That's your office. That is what you do. That is who you are. So, Does it matter for you in your life? Does it matter to you that God had a plan for you to be part of his royal priesthood, to be part of his chosen people? Does that change the way that you think about how you live your life? Most definitely it should, correct? Our lives should be transformed by the fact that we are now identified as God's people. You know what the interesting thing about this is people who are not Christian know exactly how you should be living your life. And the minute you tell people you're a Christian, they're happy to point it out to you if you're not living your life like as a Christian. Because they know the difference between sinful desires and and not. Right? It, It should be easy for us as Christians to see in one another Are we living as royal priesthood? Are we living as a holy nation? Are the things of God, the things that are holy, are they something that you desire and love? I mean, think of what it is that you love about Christ. You love his holiness, the way that he dies for you, his way that he served others, the way that he gave his life for others. It's those things that are holy. It is those things that draw us to him. And those are the qualities that we should be seeing in one another. And more or less, we should be seeing in ourselves. Because if you have the Holy Spirit living in you as a Christian, this is the reality. If I'm claiming to be a Christian, and I have the Holy Spirit living in me, and I continue to sin, or as Paul says, if I continue to sleep with a prostitute, it's impossible. Because you can't claim to be a Christian, and continue to be happy living in a sinful life. And that's so important for us in living out our office. Why? Because we are living sacrifices to God. So we cannot tolerate sin in our lives because we are the temple of God. We cannot tolerate sin in our lives. We are to abstain from our sinful desires. Why? Because we are being built together into this spiritual house for the Lord. And this is where we admonish one another and encourage one another in our faith. It's where we we recognize that we are part of this bigger family, this royal priesthood, this 
role that we have to play with one another and this building up of the temple of God. We must never forget that. In the Heidelberg Catechism, it asks this question, and, and this is part of what it is to understand who you are as a Christian. Is like what, if, if you ask the question, why are you called a Christian? Because I am a member of Christ by faith, and therefore I share in his anointing, so that I may, as a prophet, confess his name, as a priest, present myself as a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him, and as a king, fight with the free and good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and thereafter reign with him, Christ, eternally over all things or all creatures. So what I want us to know, what I want us to remember today, as I conclude, is I want you to remember who you are. I want you to even memorize for yourself 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people belonging to God. That is who you are if Christ is your cornerstone. Let's pray together. Father, we humbly come before you with a contrite heart today. We confess to you that there was a time where we rejected Christ. Each one of us at one point rejected him for our salvation. We thought maybe we knew a better way. Or maybe, Lord, we just didn't care. But today we come to you and we recognize how precious he is in our sight because he is the one that you have chosen to save all of humankind. That he is the one that there is no other name by which we might be saved but the name of Jesus. Because he is the one who died for us. And so, Lord, we pray that it is through him that we might offer spiritual sacrifices to you. That we might be holy as you are holy. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be a chosen people and a royal priesthood. That we are a holy nation, that we are being built into a house where the worship for you is acceptable. Only through the name of Jesus Christ. Because, Lord, it says that we belong to you. And there is nothing greater than that. We thank you for him. The cornerstone once rejected, but now precious in our sight. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood a holy people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have.